with you this morning. Uh, really disappointing not to have Mark and Zoe's baptism, um, but I'm sure that will happen sometime soon in the future, but terrific to have our brigades with us this morning, and I know there's some uh, friends and family who are here with our brigade kids, so special welcome to you. Uh, lovely to be with you. And uh, yes, AJ alluded to, and you saw in, in their video, I got to visit both Boys and Girls Brigade uh, earlier this year. So thanks both for hosting me. Uh, it, was a, it was a terrific time. It was a shame that you didn't have a shot of the uh, arrows in the board, AJ, but I did manage to equal William's best on my first go. <laughs> I know that. Uh, let me pray as we do something more important than me bragging as we come to God's word. Uh, God, we, we thank you for an occasion to gather and worship you, uh, to give thanks to your goodness to us in so many ways. Uh, and Lord, we pray that as we consider this story of, of the Passover, uh, of your rescue of your people from Egypt, uh, that you would teach us from it, that it would cause us uh, to delight in the salvation that you have won for us uh, in a richer and deeper way, we pray. Amen. Uh, well, you can't help but have noticed, football fan or not, that State of Origin number one uh, happened this week and the, the ladies game was on Thursday night as well. Uh, one of the more unusual things that happened in the Wednesday night in the men's game was that Queensland was fined $30,000 afterwards. Anyone know why? Any of the kids know why? We had too many players on the field for a couple of minutes. Ten minutes into the game, ten minutes or so, Tom Gilbert went in for a tackle and got smashed. Uh, he dislocated his shoulder and kind of stumbled off to the far side of the field. Uh, in his place, uh, did I write to move some dog? I didn't. Uh, in his place, someone else came on and Tom Gilbert hadn't made it off the field when the other guy came on. And so there was a couple of minutes there where there was two people on doing the same thing. <coughs> So what do you do when, when you've uh, dislocated your shoulder or something else like that in, in a game? Perhaps you're just too exhausted and it's time to get off uh, in your game of uh, soccer or it's Aussie rules of netball in my family. What do you do? Yell out, sub, sub! Uh, and hopefully someone willing jumps off the bench uh, and runs in to take your place in the game. In the game. That was, yeah, it was Lindsay Collins, there it is, uh, on Wednesday night who subbed in for Tom Gilbert. He came on to do his job for him. This thing doesn't just happen in sports though, does it? As uh, you're talking about uh, cooking with the girls brigade, Meg was reminding me that uh, often we make substitutes in a recipe, in, in ingredients. Now typically that's a bad thing, I reckon. <laughs> often it's like, let's put wholemeal flour in there instead of white flour. Uh, or these days, it's let's substitute in some vegan thing where there should be meat. Uh, and those kind of things and pretend that we still love it. Uh, but we do this substitute thing all, all over the place. Anytime someone has to take your place to sub in instead of you, they're called your substitute. And what we read about in today's passage uh, is this strange thing that happened in history three and a half thousand years ago and a strange ceremony that goes with that. But it's really all about God making a substitution. If you haven't been with us uh, this term, we've been reading and preaching through the book of Exodus, and we're going to be doing that uh, through to the end of term three. Uh, we looked at, at the plagues last week that God brought upon the nation of Egypt as he was preparing to rescue his people. Uh, we had the, the river Nile turning to blood. We had flies and frogs and gnats and boils and blood and darkness and all kinds of things. God wanted to make it abundantly clear that he was more powerful than all the gods of Egypt. And that indeed it was he, he was the one who was going to rescue his people from Israel. In chapter 11, that the final plague was predicted and that was to be the death of the firstborn son in every household in Egypt. And verses 4 and 5 of chapter 11 said, This is what the Lord says, about midnight I will go through Egypt, every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her handmill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. This is going to be awful. You can sort of just imagine it. You prefer not to. There's going to be 
death and sadness in every Egyptian household. Of course, this is supposed to be understood as a clear retribution, a clear payback for what Egypt has already done to Israel when they drowned their sons in the Nile River, which we read back at the start of the story. And so they are going to get what they deserve. The Lord makes it clear that to Moses that this is going to be the final plague. There's been all these other crazy, chaotic things going on and, and Pharaoh keeps saying, right, you can leave. And then he changes his mind. Says, no, no, you, you've got to stay. God makes it clear this will be the climax. This will be the last one. After this one, Moses, they're definitely, you, he will let you go. And so from the beginning, God makes it clear that, that the firstborn sons of the Israelites, though, they won't die. They're going to be saved. In verse 7 of chapter 12, uh, he says, Then you will know, uh, sorry, chapter 11, Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God is going to pass over the Israelite firstborn sons so that they will not die. But how? How are they going to escape? How will they be spared? Well, Moses has reported all this to Pharaoh. And once again, he's expecting Pharaoh to capitulate and say, look, that won't be necessary, Moses. Just, just go now. But he doesn't. He's still hard-hearted. And so Moses leaves him kind of enraged at his stubbornness. And then chapter 12, which we look at today, is where these events begin to take place. And the story kind of slows right down and describes to us in detail these events of what we call the Passover and the preparations that they had to make. Uh, you've actually got two speeches going on here. The first 20 verses, which AJ read for us, are God speaking to Moses, telling him uh, what's going to happen and what the people need to do. And then uh, in the following verses, Moses then speaks to the people of Israel, uh, essentially saying uh, the same things and reiterating the, the message to them. Both speeches talk about the actual events that are going to happen and what they must do but also about the commemoration of the Passover that's supposed to continue on. Uh, it's a truly amazing story. This happened about three and a half thousand years ago, kids. That's a long time, and we're still talking about it. Uh, if you're at brigades or, or kids club, uh, if you're not a brigade kid, uh, hopefully you've heard this story before. God gives Moses and Aaron these instructions that they had to pass on to the people. And God says this event is so important, we're going to change your calendar. The month that this happens in is now going to be the first month of your calendar, Israel. This is going to be a once in a millennium kind of event. And this is going to be an event for the whole community of Israel. And we're talking probably more than a million people by this stage. Every single household is going to take a lamb, a young sheep or a young goat, it's to be a one year old, it's to be a male, and it's to be without defect. No, no blemishes, nothing obviously wrong with it. And every single one of these will be slaughtered at once by the whole community at dusk, household by household. They're to take the blood and using a bunch of hyssop to paint the blood around their doors, on the doorposts of their houses. And then having roasted that animal whole, I feel like I'm on a boys' brigade camp at this moment. <laughs> Having roasted it whole over a fire, house by house, they had to then eat that lamb that they have sacrificed and eat all of it. And none of it's to be left, uh, along with the bitter herbs and the bread that they've made without yeast. Everyone had to eat the meat and all of the meat had to be eaten. And then no one is to leave their homes until morning until the judgment of God has been meted out in full. And then in verses 11 and 12, uh, we read this. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. As the Israelites have this meal sitting there safely in their homes, God is going to pass through the land of Egypt and all the firstborn males in their households will die. 
brothers, fathers, sons. That's going to be total carnage. There's going to be grief through Egypt like has never been experienced. But the Israelites, with the blood painted on their door, they're going to be passed over. They won't be touched. Now there's some really important details here that help us understand what's really going on. The significance of what's happening. Notice God tells them how they are to eat the meal. That was in verse 11. This is how you're to eat it. You're to tuck your cloak into your belt with your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now as I read that, it sounds to me like one of those silly youth group games or perhaps a brigade game where you've got to you, know, you, you roll a dice and when it's your turn, if you roll a six, you've got to put a whole lot of silly clothes on and usually a hat and something like that and then you get the knife and the fork and the big family bar of chocolate and you've got to cut, what, have you guys not done that one yet? Okay. If you haven't, you need to make sure you do it. Right, yeah, COVID makes that hard. We did it at a birthday party at our house recently. Uh, um, and you've got to have your turn at the food until someone else rolls a six. But this isn't, this isn't for a laugh. It's not just, oh, wear something funny. It's all about readiness. They're to be dressed for action, ready to move, ready to run for it. You know, normally they kind of recline at the table. You relax as you gather as a family to have your meal. You know, you, you've, you've got your slippers on and your stay-at-home clothes and that kind of stuff. Now, these guys are going to be dressed and ready. They're not sitting in the recliner chair ready to watch some Netflix or turn the footy on or something like that. They're going to be dressed, ready to go. That Their cloak is not going to be hanging down in their way. It's going to be tucked in so that they can run. Shoes on, even their staff in their hand, ready to go. Uh, when I was a kid... And I had uh, so a teenager and had soccer training on the next morning. I think it was probably a seven o'clock start, which seemed really early when I was a teenager. Uh, my kids would have no trouble getting anywhere at seven o'clock uh, at their age, because they're up so early. But I would go to sleep the night before with my training kit on. Uh, not my boots, uh, not quite what's being described here, uh, but basically the rest of it. Instead of PJs, I put my soccer kit on, and so when Dad would wake me up and say, boy, we've got to go in 15 minutes, uh, I could eat my wheat fix and, and be out of the house, ready to go. That's kind of the picture here. They are, they are ready to move. They are to eat in haste. The, the journey is to be made in haste, and so much so, this emphasised as well by how they prepare the meal. There's going to be no yeast in the dough. And you would have noticed it as AJ read in verses 14 to 20, eight times it says there's to be no yeast there's to be no yeast there's to be no yeast bread without yeast clearly it's important not to have yeast uh, and now i'm uh, way out of my expertise here but i know that while you when you cook bread and yeast is involved uh, you prepare the thing and you need it and at some point you just have to leave that thing to sit and you leave it to sit for a while well as the israelites are going to be hightailing it out of there, out of Egypt. They're not going to have time for the dough to rise. And so there's to be no yeast involved in this meal. They're going to have flatbread this time. Instead of sandwiches, it'll be wraps. <laughs> There'll be no time to wait for the dough to rise. And so everything about this meal points to them, points to readiness. Be, be ready to go because God is going to do this thing. See, it's an indication that they completely trust God, that they take God at his word. If you, if you make a dough that waits, needs to wait to rise, you're saying, God, I'm not sure that you're actually going to deliver. But by making the bread this way, by dressing ready to go, they're saying, I'm convinced God will do exactly what he said. He will deliver them. He tells them as well about the meaning and the significance of what he's doing. In bringing about the death of the firstborn in Egypt, there in verse 12 he says, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So this is not just some natural disaster or some random event happening. God makes it very clear this is an act of judgment on Egypt and on their gods. I mentioned already how they uh, previously were drowning the Israelite boys in the Nile. But this is also against their God. See, all the way through the plagues, which we read about last week, uh, there's clear reference to different Egyptian gods. That, that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is saying, I'm bigger and I'm more powerful. 
When I do frogs, I'm bigger than that one. When I do flies, I'm bigger than that one. And that's been going on and on through here. And so God wants it very clear that he is the one who is all powerful. He is the one true God. It's the gods of the Egyptians who are being judged and people for worshipping them. Everyone is to know that the God of Israel, the one true God, is superior to all the others. And what they eat is, is significant as well. Now, wonder kids, uh, my kids do this to me all the time. If they uh, got their, their lunchbox there, and sometimes I want to share their lunch with them, right? Uh, and they might have, say they've got 10 grapes. Grapes are, are on the menu at the moment. My kids love grapes. Uh, there's always preferences, though, about different colours and sizes, and there's different kinds of <laughs> not green ones, and all this kind of carry on. They're a bit fussy, and, and guaranteed of my three kids who are all having with the flu this morning, unfortunately. They never all like the same thing. But if you've got 10 grapes in your lunchbox, by the time you crack that open to eat it, guaranteed there's three or four squishy ones in the bottom, isn't there? It always seems to happen. Mum gets the blame in our house for putting the squishy ones in there. I don't think that's how it works. But there's always a couple of duds. You know, they've gone squishy or the skin has split or maybe they even smell funny. And so if I say to my kids, look, can I have one of your grapes or a couple of your grapes? They've got a choice at that moment. There's always a decision that they're making. Do I give dad one of the good ones, the crunchy, juicy ones, or is he going to get one of the squishy ones? <laughs> right? Uh, let me tell you, it's not always one of the good ones that comes my <laughs> way. Far too often you're like, what is that thing you just gave me? Now it's a bit like this when the Israelites came to choosing the lamb they would sacrifice. They weren't to use just any sheep from in their flock, just, just to grab the dregs. They were to use the best one. The lamb or the kid goat uh, the Israelites would have sacrificed was to be an, an unblemished year-old male. So a young lamb, a young goat, uh, a boy, and one that had nothing wrong with it. One that as perfect as they could find. And this is no coincidence. It's the firstborn male sons of both people and livestock throughout all of Egypt that are going to die. And so it's this young male animal that they are to sacrifice. The firstborn sons of the Israelites, they're going to live. But only because this young male perfect sheep or goat is going to die instead of them. And it's one for each household, that, that connection to each family. There's not a, a priest or Moses doing this on behalf of the nation. It's every household that's kind of entering into this together. And he tells them about the significance of the blood. Remember, he says, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, God says, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. They're going to paint that blood over their houses, which is gross, right? It's disgusting. And again, every family is doing this. It's not some weird priest who does this all the time. In my kids' storybooks, I looked up a bunch of them yesterday. Often the, the picture they paint in the illustration is of one of the children holding a bowl full of the animal's blood while dad paints the door. They're, they're really engaged with this. The blood... Uh, the, the, this is going to be a sign that the occupants of that house are placing themselves under God's protection so that they would be spared. You see, the blood was protection. It didn't provide a barrier in itself. It was protection because as God passed over their homes, he saw the blood of the Lamb and he saw a family clearly indicating, God, you've told us that this is how we're to escape. And so we're going to trust you. That's our way to escape. Yeah, you can imagine if, if the firstborn's going to be killed in every house, one option is to try and get the help of it, to try and run away. But God says, no, this is how I'll protect you. You will paint the blood on your doors. I will spare those who show that they have placed their faith in me, God says. And so as those Israelite families sit there, huddled in their homes that night, having prepared their flat bread, having eaten the roast lamb, they know that God has chosen to save their sons. The lamb who died, the lamb whose blood is painted on their house, 
It gave its life in place of the life of their sons, their brothers, their fathers. It couldn't be any clearer. The Passover lamb died as their substitute. Without the lamb, they would have died. Just like you substitute in a game of football, in a football team, the lamb is the substitute for the sons and brothers and fathers in their hearts. And this is such a big event, uh, the story says, God says, this is an event worth remembering. Uh, Three times in uh, verse 14, verse 17 and verse 24 of chapter 12, they are told to remember and they're going to be told again. Verse 14 says, This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Now kids, I wonder how you uh, remember things. In particular, um, how do you remember your times tables? Who here is learning times tables at school at the moment? That's an enthusiastic response. I've got a few others. I'm not going to test you. It's all right. But how do you remember them? Anyone got any special techniques that they use? What do you say, Caleb? Oh, all right. Yeah? I remember, like, the um, sheet on the door of the toilet. Nice. Yeah. There's a sheet on the door of the toilet. Does anyone have a song? <coughs> right, I've got a hand up the back. My wife is rubbish at maths. She may not see this. Um, but she's musical. The only reason she knows her time tables, I'm convinced, is because she learnt 12 different songs. Uh, and she tries to play them in our car so that our children can learn. And uh, I'm convinced there's a better way. Um, but rhymes, songs, just repetition. Uh, for me, what made it stick was kind of those tricks. Uh, they're, they're not for all of them, but there's often a little trick there about how, like in the 11 times tables, you just double the digits. The 9 times tables, that the numbers always add up to 9, uh, and that kind of stuff. I, I love that kind of stuff. It's my engineering brain. Uh, it might be a bit unconventional, although it's favoured in the Campling household as well. But in our house, we have a chart behind the toilet door. Uh, that's where you go to learn your times tables. <laughs> now Gemma's in grade four. She's supposed to be well progressed in her times tables. Turns out the chart in the toilet is not helping particularly. But the person it is helping is Josh, who's in prep, who doesn't need to know any times tables yet. <laughs> but he's worked out it's kind of cool to learn some of the hard ones. He's not interested in the two times tables and the three times tables. But he'll sit there doing his thing and study a couple of the 12 times tables. And after he's taken way too long in the bathroom, he kind of saunters out and he's like, hey dad, what's three times 12? <laughs> 36, come on. <laughs> he thinks that's awesome. <laughs> but really, what they remember here, of course, it's something far more solemn, far more significant than that, isn't it? It's a bit more like us as a nation remembering Anzac Day. Remembering this thing that is significant in the life of our nation, that, that formed us, that kind of made us who we are. That's what this Passover event is for Israel. It's important to them, so important to them as a people that they must remember it forever. It's become a defining thing in terms of how they understand themselves as a nation. And so that I have this week-long festival, no one's going to eat bread with yeast in it for a whole week. Only flatbread to remind them of the night that they had to get out of there. And they're going to share that Passover meal, the, the roast lamb and, and the herbs, to remember that God provided a substitute for them, a lamb to die in their place. They're going to remember God's justice as he had to judge the sin of the Egyptians. And they're going to remember God's mercy as God passed over them and rescued them. God rescues them, he redeems them, not by simply just picking up the Israelites and taking them out of Egypt. He could have done that, but his means of rescuing them is to offer a substitute, to offer that lamb in their place, and for them to have to express their faith in that method by painting the blood on the door. And that's always how God's done. God did the rescuing. God had to come against sin and rebellion. But he makes a way of escape from the judgment. And it's such a big deal that they're supposed to remember it forever. Now, if it's not obvious yet, there's parallels everywhere here to the gospel. 
Uh, in the New Testament, it speaks about Jesus as our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so as we think about what God's done for us through Jesus and in the gospel, as we look at this story about the Passover and that lamb in particular, we're supposed to see Jesus. He is the one who is a, a substitute for us. He is the one who is sacrificed to be our substitute. And so we must trust in the sacrifice of Jesus, who died as our substitute, if we're to escape God's judgment and to receive rescue and freedom and salvation. And we've got a rescue event far more amazing than the Passover, right? Israelites, Jews have been celebrating this for three and a half thousand years. This is their moment as a nation that they go, that's where really it began. That's where God took us out and set us free and made us his people. We're going to remember that every year at the first month of the year, forever and ever. We've got an even more amazing event. And that distinction that God made that first Passover night, is the distinction he always makes. Has the substitute died in your place? If it has, you're rescued, you're one of mine. Kids, for us, that's Jesus. Adults, for us, that's Jesus. He's the Passover lamb who dies instead of us, who takes the judgment of God instead of us. Can I encourage you, whether you're nine or 90, uh, to trust Jesus as your substitute. Either he pays for us, he goes in for us, or we wear it on ourselves. And so we who have trusted Christ, we who have received the rescue that God has won for us through Jesus, well, we must remember and never forget. If the Passover was worth remembering year after year after year forever, then we must make sure we remember and never forget you might remember that Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, was sharing exactly this meal with his disciples, the Passover meal. And he says to them, as they share that meal, he says, I'm going to transform this remembrance thing. And we're going to do it differently from here on. In Luke chapter 2, verse 20, he says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He's, he's had the bread and broken it and shared it amongst them. And then he takes the cup and he says this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The old covenant, the old thing that we did was a lamb that was given and its blood poured out for you so that you could be rescued. Jesus says, God's going to do something completely new. My blood is going to be poured out <coughs> so that I can be your substitute and, and you can be rescued. And so he gives us a new meal to remember that, doesn't he? That's what we do when we share communion or the Lord's Supper together. We eat bread and we drink wine or dark red juice and we remember God's great rescue of us. And we celebrate it until he comes again. But it's not just about communion. Uh, let me read you a couple of verses, verses 24 to 28 from chapter 12 there. It says, Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance. For you and your descendants, that's keep remembering this forever. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And then it says the people bowed down in worship and they did what Moses had said. So th this is what being a Christian is all about. This is what bringing on the next generation is all about. It's what ministries like Boys and Girls Brigade are really all about. But when you boil it down, it's not primarily about badges and achievements and archery and those kind of things. It's what all Christian parenting is all about. When your children ask, what on earth are we doing? When we share communion together and my kids say, Dad, What's that weird meal that we do at church? What's the bread and the juice all about? Why do we gather, Mum and Dad, with Christians every Sunday for worship, to pray and worship and hear God's Word? 
Why do we talk about the cross and Jesus' death all the time? Mum and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, Nan and Pop, what does this all mean to you? At that point, we explain not the Passover, but the Gospel. That God gave His Son Jesus as our substitute to die in our place, to set us free. Answering that question is really what it's all about, isn't it? And so I want to challenge the adults in the room. If you're a believer and have trusted God, are you doing that? Are you taking every and any opportunity to pass this good news on to the next generation? Don't wait for the children to ask. Tell, tell them anyway. Do you have an answer ready? Do you have an answer personally? Do you know for yourself that you have trusted God and, and put Jesus as your substitute in your place? And are you answering the next generation off? Letting them know what it is that God has done for them. I think that's an incredible uh, priority for us, a challenge for us. Uh, let me pray. God, we thank you so much for giving Jesus to us as our substitute. The one who died instead of us so that we could be set free and escape God's judgment even though we deserved it. And we could be forgiven and set free and receive eternal life. Lord, we pray, I pray that anyone here, kids or grown-ups, who hasn't yet trusted Jesus, that they would carefully consider that, Lord, and that they would indeed put their trust in you as their substitute. And Lord, I pray that we would remember that and never forget. Lord, in brigades, in our families, in our other church ministries, from generation to generation, to remember and celebrate always that Jesus was given as our substitute. We praise you, God.